Welcome to the center of it all and good day to you. There's a house on Penn State's campus that could be out of this world and we do investigate it out. The State College Spikes home opener is right around the corner and we're really excited about it. Mel cooks up her delicious and not to mention published Texas chili dogs on the latest kitchen encounters. So stick around as we have these and more coming up next on the center of it all. Thanks for joining us for the center of it all. I'm your host, Alex Rabb. Now let's dive into the show. There's something interesting on campus that caught my eye. So I went over to Penn State Sustainability Center to see exactly what it is. You may or may not have noticed a house in the fields off of Porter Road when headed towards Beaver Stadium. It seems out of place, but actually it's not. Located at the Sustainability Experience Center on Penn State's campus, the Morning Star Pennsylvania Solar Home is a very important part of Penn State's advancing leadership in energy solutions for our future. I met up with Dr. David Riley, a faculty member in the Department of Architectural Engineering at Penn State, who explained why. It's designed to provide a place where people can come and get their hands dirty and also have a chance to see, touch and feel uh, some sustainability uh, techniques and practices um, and uh, to do that in a way that really uh, really makes it real. The Morningstar Pennsylvania was originally built for the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon in 2007. Now it's a great hands-on real-life model. It has those residential strategies and technologies that um, are interesting to many of us because we all go home at the end of the day and the Morningstar is uh, a great tool to show off um, different techniques and practices that people can incorporate into their own homes. You really can have a home that's not only beautiful and luxurious, but it's also energy efficient too. The local and regionally accessed materials of the Morningstar are just one feature which helps reduce the home's overall carbon footprint. And there's more. One of the unique features of the Morningstar is that it's actually connected to four different types of renewable energy systems. So we have geothermal energy, wind energy, solar thermal energy, and solar electric systems. And the house lets us explore and demonstrate the value of those different kinds of systems. It shows the homeowner how to generate the electricity they need and to not completely rely on the electrical grid. Impressively enough, there's also extra energy produced that powers the electric vehicle. There are also very efficient appliances and water fixtures that are intended to minimize uh, the amount of energy that goes into uh, using and cleaning water. The center really wants to show how you can live more efficiently in all aspects of life. There's also a kitchen garden right outside the home, showing how much energy you can save by growing your own food. This solar home gives back to the community and extends the knowledge through tours and classes. So the Morning Star is also the home of the National Energy Leadership Corps, which is a program that's under development at the Sustainability Institute at Penn State. And it's intended to teach students to give uh, home energy assessments uh, in their own communities. The features were inspired by the Morning Star people of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe in Montana. Through their lessons and interactions, the team that built their home learned about the tribe's values on sustainability. There's also another reason for the home's name. The Morning Star is actually the planet Venus which is visible in the eastern sky just before sunrise. And just like the planet Venus, the Morning Star is intended to help lead solar energy into a community. If you'd like to learn more about solar energy and the Morning Star Pennsylvania Solar Home, head over to sustainability.psu.edu. But don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Welcome back to the center of it all. The State College Spikes are about to kick off their 2013 season. It's a great time to be outside, so why not enjoy all that the Spikes have to offer with your friends or family? John Stroh stopped by to see what's new. The State College Spikes are ready to open their eighth season at Lebrano Park, and the big story heading into 2013 is a new affiliation that brings the club full circle in a very short time. General Manager Jason Dombach talked about the team's new affiliation. Major news of the offseason was returning to the St. Louis Cardinals, and they're just a great group to work with. We had such a, uh, a great experience with them in our inaugural season back in 2006. Obviously, a lot of uh, things have changed between now and then, but a lot has stayed the same. And the stability that the Cardinals offer, um, the, the mark that that franchise made on us here in State College, particularly in year number one, has never been forgotten. 
The Spikes enjoyed their most successful season as a Cardinals affiliate in 2006 and sent an amazing nine players from that team to the major leagues. And Don Back talked about what makes the Cardinals such a successful organization. Is they have a way of doing things that is consistent. Uh, they've been doing it the same way since the 1920s when Branch Rickey initiated the farm system for the St. Louis Cardinals and started a trend, of course, that we all enjoy today. I mean, the Cardinals were the innovators of the farm system. Um, the individuals who lead the player development instruction are very similar. There's a consistent approach throughout their organization. Whether that translates to a championship here or not, I don't know but it's fun to be part of an organization that is so consistent. The affiliation change has also brought a sense of excitement to the organization as well. You know, it gives us a story to tell the entire off season. Uh, it's what we opened every phone call with when our salespeople were talking to the business community or individuals about season tickets or group packages, sales in general. It, it gave us a story to tell, a uh, great launching point early in the off season to get ready for the 2013 season. So absolutely, and it breathes life into our staff. Um, we're all excited to work with a new group of people um, to uh, have the opportunity to, to show off our skills to an organization like the Cardinals. The Spikes are famous for having a great promotional schedule, and 2013 will be no different. And Don Back spoke about the excitement of having the one millionth fan enter the park. Well, right out of the gate, we're welcoming our one millionth fan in franchise history. Uh, we're going to celebrate that on opening night, June 17th. Uh, that's a great milestone for our franchise in year number eight. You know, we're going to have some uh, great prizes for that fan that's selected as our millionth fan. They'll win season tickets for life. They'll have a chance to uh, come down on the field and roll dice for a million dollars. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a great launching point for the entire season. There's a ton of other great promotions as well. And we've got Bill O'Brien bobblehead doll night uh, towards the end of the year. So we've got great bookend promotions all the way in between. 12 fireworks shows, 17 giveaway nights. Great appearances like uh, Mountain Man from, from Duck Dynasty, which is uh, one of our most popular nights already in terms of ticket sales for the year. So, you know, it's more, you, you know that every night you come to the ballpark, you're going to see promotions that um, supplement what we do here at the ballpark. Uh, great value and affordability. And just really the, the best night out in central Pennsylvania is at a Spikes game. And, we feel like we're the most fun, affordable family entertainment option that's out there. Along with these great promotions, the Spikes have added some additional seating as well. We added uh, what we call the Rail King section, which has always been sold out from day one. There are seats that hover above the, uh, the bullpen areas that got waiter, waitress service. Uh, we had uh, 24 of those. We were able to carve out an area where we'll add 16 more uh, Rail King seats. And uh, again, they're a premium seat here at the ballpark that, that offers waiter, waitress service great view of the ballpark and uh, just a unique experience. The Spikes home opener is Monday, June 17th against the Williamsport Crosscutters. For the center of it all, I'm John Stroh. I honestly can't wait for the season to start. Spikes games are so much fun. Thanks, John. We have to take a quick break. Mel takes us to the ball game with a classic and just oh so good Texas chili dog. Thanks for joining the center of it all. I hope you brought your appetite. It is no lie that Mel Prosciutti, a resident foodie, knows her stuff. If you've ever had a true Texas chili dog, then you know it's the best way to eat a hot dog. It's the focus of this week's Kitchen Encounters. Texas-style chili dogs are slathered in yellow ballpark mustard and topped with a chunky all-meat chili sauce. People think they were invented in Texas, but they weren't. They were invented in 1924 in Patterson, New Jersey by a Greek immigrant who used spices and flavorings from his own heritage. Because he used hand ground steak to make his chili sauce instead of store-bought ground beef, it got its Texas nickname. Because Texas-style chili dogs freeze so well, I always make a big batch, and I like to use London broil. This is what's going to give it its signature chewy to the tooth texture. I've cubed three pounds of London broil and put it in my food processor, and I'm gonna use about 30 pulses to grind this to a nice, fine mix.
If you don't have a big food processor like this, you can do this in separate batches. And before I did my meat, I also did three pounds of yellow onion and three quarters of a pound of celery the exact same way. I've placed all of my minced ground steak in a big wide bottom seven quart skillet and I've added all of that minced onion and now I'm adding all of that wonderful celery. I'm going to stir this really thoroughly to get all the ingredients mixed together and then I'm going to turn the heat on and I'm going to let it simmer Oh, just a gentle simmer but a steady simmer for an hour to an hour and a half until almost all of the liquid has evaporated from the bottom of the pan. And don't worry so much about the time it takes. It's more important that the liquid evaporate from the bottom of the pan. This has been simmering for about an hour and 15 minutes, and you can see how there's almost no liquid in the bottom of the pan. That's exactly what you want. You don't want to let this mixture brown. And now, making Texas-style chili sauce couldn't be easier. We're going to add a cup and a half of regular ketchup, a cup and a half of chili sauce, six tablespoons of ballpark mustard, six tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, and six tablespoons of cayenne pepper sauce, three tablespoons of chili powder, and the Greek secret, a teaspoon and a half of ground cloves. I'm gonna stir this one all again together and we're going to let this simmer on the stove top for about 45 minutes to another hour until it's all thickened and after that ideally you remove it from the heat cover the pan and let it sit for an hour or two to let all of the spices marry together Back in 2007, America's Test Kitchen in Boston, the publishers of Cook's Illustrated and Cook's Country Magazines, chose my Texas-style chili recipe to appear in their America's Best Lost Cookbook. This was an honor because all of the recipes that appear in this book don't appear in any other cookbooks. So, the next time you're enjoying America's favorite pastime, Pass the time eating one of my real deal chili dogs. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. It's so good. I'm betting you'll like it, even if you're not a hot dog person. We have to take another break, you know, pay the bills, but stick around. Welcome back to the center of it all. I'm Alex Rabb. 
Our Andrew Callista taught us how to properly care for our lawn, and now it's time to switch the focus to our driveway. We all have summer projects around the house, and one of those is sealing our driveway. And I wanted to find out the best way you could do it. So right now, I'm with Justin Can from K and K Seal Coating. And Justin, you ready to get this project started? Let's start. All right, let's do it. All you need to get started is crack filler, driveway cleaner, a brush, and of course, sealer. Simple enough that anyone can do it. Just how Justin explained. First thing you want to do is. Uh, look for cracks on the driveway. Uh, they do make some crack repair material there with, with the sale of the driveway sealer. Uh, get them fixed first. Now if the cracks are deep, use sand to backfill and save some product. For deep holes or repairs, use cold patch and be sure to tamp it down evenly. Then uh, you want to clean, prep the driveway, uh, hose it off if it's muddy. Uh, then uh, whatever you have, broom, a blower, get the debris off the driveway. And don't forget to edge back the grass around your driveway to keep your lawn in tip-top shape. Get the sealer mixed up because usually uh, the sand and stuff is settled to the bottom in the bucket, so you want to get them stirred up enough where you're not getting out liquid first, then into solid stuff. So you want it pretty mixed well. You want to get probably an edging brush, a small little brush, so you can edge around uh, the corners of the house or the garage. Then uh, just start pouring a seam around the garage Start edging it with your edging brush around the corners. Uh, stay away from concrete and the, and the siding and stuff. Once you pour the initial sealer at the start of the blacktop, once you get everything edged and pull back, you want to pull it back smooth, fan it out, then get the, that more sealer from the bucket, pour it out, and just continuously keep doing that. But you want to keep it smoothed out. You don't want puddling of the sealer in the driveway. You just want to keep it smoothed out and keep working your way back to the end. To avoid color patches, begin to mix buckets after your first bucket is halfway empty. Do this until the project is completely finished and then block off your driveway. Now it's time to wait. 24 hours, stay off of it for 24 hours. Um, it'll air dry within an hour, two hours, depends on the weather. And uh, then after 24 hours, you can drive right on it. And if you happen to see any tire marking from turning and steering after that, it actually takes the sealer one to two weeks to cure and them tire marks will go away. It's the sand in the sealer that's making the tire marks, but uh, after it cures, does its final cure, everything will go away and it'll blend in and be good. If you're a new homeowner, you might need some help getting started. What better place than your local hardware store where I found Grant Rosenberger ready to help. So we sell everything you need to seal your own driveway. Um, it's, not a, it's not a horrible process, but you do need to uh, set a day aside to do it, depending on the size of your driveway. Make sure that day starts off at about 60 degrees and has a rising temp. That way the sealer holds. You can do a great job on your own, but if you're not the do-it-yourself type, give Justin a call. I use a commercial grade Sealmaster sealer. It's a cool tar sealer. It has uh, one and a half to two pounds of sand in it for traction. It has the different additives in, a uh, top tough additive, which makes it last longer, makes it blacker, uh, and it you know, repels gas, oil, anything like that and it just it stays longer, three to five years. You know, some of the stuff that you get from the, out of the buckets, uh, you've seen it before on other driveways, six months a year, it's gone. If you have the time to do it yourself, Justin recommends buying the best sealer you can. After all, a driveway is an investment, but don't overdo it. Nah, you don't want to put too much sealer on because uh, if you put too much, it'll start stress cracking. So that's why you want to get a nice, good coat, smooth it out, let the sealer absorb into the blacktop and you know you're rejuvenating it that's why you seal it uh, if you didn't seal it you know your blacktop life won't be as long so you don't want too thick and you don't want too thin you just want right enough and that's what the applicator brush will do it'll smooth it out for enough and uh, then you'll be good if it's been a while since your last coating or maybe this is your first grant has one more piece of advice in addition to those people who haven't ever done their driveway or haven't done it in a long time you, you might want to definitely think about redoing it the next year to build up a, a nice coating. Um, if you're the type of person who does it every year or every two years, you know, you're gonna, you'll see fantastic results. Um, but if, if driveway's never been done before, it might not hurt to do it again the next summer. To keep your driveway looking like a hot piece of asphalt, now is a great time to get started before the dog days of summer really kick in. For the center of it all, I'm Andrew Callista. Thanks, Andrew. Let's hit the pavement and get to another hot topic. Teenagers texting while driving. 
Not a good combo. Let's see what advice our friends over at Cleveland Clinic have to give. A teenager texting behind the wheel is dangerous enough, but a new study finds teens who text while driving may also be more likely to engage in other risky behaviors behind the wheel. Dr. Kate Eshelman did not take part in the study, but is a child psychologist at Cleveland Clinic Children's. It's not surprising that, that kids are doing it fairly often. Um, kids also think they're invincible. They don't necessarily think through the risks, and even if they think there is a risk, they think it's not going to happen to them. Researchers at the Center for Disease Control surveyed more than 8,500 teenagers. Nearly half of them reported texting while driving within the past 30 days. These students were also more likely to engage in additional risky motor vehicle behaviors like drinking and driving, riding with a driver who had been drinking and not always wearing a seatbelt. Researchers say the behavior may place themselves, their passengers and others on the road at an increased risk for a crash. Dr. Eshelman agrees and says it's important for parents to set a good example. I think the most important way is model good behavior. If you don't want your kids to text while driving or if you want them to wear their seatbelt, make sure you're doing the same thing. Complete findings for the study are in the journal Pediatrics. Play it safe for you and others on the road. But thanks for watching. That's that. Now if you haven't before and can, hop online in the near future and like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Have a great rest of your day.